Um, but 27 years ago in March, I bought this Bible uh, when I was called to pastor at the Apple Creek Church. Prior to that, I had a uh, King James Version, which I still have, uh, but I found that for regular preaching, the NIV was better, and so I started to, to use this one, but this one's been beat up quite a bit. Uh, and uh, I just received a gift of a Bible, because I guess that one got too old, so. <laughs> Today is the first day it will be read. I have not yet read it. And I hope the pages don't stick too much. Uh, but I'm looking forward to going through it uh, because it's got many new features that my other Bible didn't have. And uh, I'm sure that it will be a great instrument in further study. And uh, it may last me for the next 27 years. I, I don't know. But uh, looking forward to its use. now. Uh, last week, we covered what? Does anybody remember? What did we cover last week? It was a very complicated, it was a very complicated uh, sermon. Uh, not one that we often hear in churches. It was about God's omnipresence, but often we limit God's omnipresence to space. Am I right? During the week I was having a discussion with somebody at lunch and I said, what do you think about omnipresence? What do you, when we talk about God's omnipresence, what do you think of? God is everywhere, was the answer. And that's where we stop. God is everywhere. But in order for us to completely understand what the word omnipresence means, in reference to God, we have to understand the presence of God not only in space, but also in time. That becomes important. It becomes important in many, many areas. For example, our elder just mentioned that God rested on the seventh day. The activities of God and the presence of God in various locations makes a difference, and time becomes a part of that discussion. God's relation to this earth and to the creation of this earth makes time and understanding of time very important. What did we discuss last week? Anybody? We had God. He changes or not changes. What did we decide? There is intrinsic change and extrinsic change. And intrinsic change is inside. So the principles of God, who God is, God's character, God's, uh, God's uh, understanding doesn't change. But relationships change. Why? Because before the existence of this earth, God had no relationship to this earth, and we did not have a relationship with God. But when God created that, then we had a relationship with God. However, that change became temporal and real when the world was created, but because God understands and lives and has complete knowledge of time, even before the earth was created, God had complete knowledge and experience of the creation. So God had a relationship with the earth and with you and me way before we were created. Like the Bible says, to, but Jeremiah, we read that last week. He said, before you were born, I made you a prophet. So God had that re relationship with Jeremiah before he was born. God had a relationship with you and I before we were born. And it says the same thing in the Bible about David. So in order for us to understand and appreciate 
God and His omnipresence, we have to understand God's and His relationship to both space and time. In case there are people wondering, why is this pastor talking about physics or time? It's important. When in discussing time last week, what did we decide? Time, there's two theories of time that we discussed. There's actually more than two. There's, there's three basic uh, theories of time that we discussed too. One was that time exists and we have the knowledge of time in the tensed. Remember what that is? What is a tensed time? Past tense, present tense, and future tense. We have very limited knowledge of the past tense. Why? Because we forget. We forget. And so our knowledge of the past is very limited. Each of us this afternoon could write about what our Sabbath school lesson was about. And I can guarantee you that all of our accounts of the Sabbath school lesson will be different. Therefore, our knowledge of the past is limited. What about the future? The knowledge of our future is even less limited. Or sorry, sorry even more limited. Now, we can make plans and more often than not because we are positive thinkers our plans for the future are usually so nice and bright and successful right now we're gonna plan this and everything is going to work out just fine you made reference to our New cars, or our new homes, or our new jobs, or our new promotions, or our new friends, or our new relationships. And we look forward and we think, oh, everything is going to be so beautiful. So in our mind, in our imagination, we plan for the future. And everything looks so nice. And that is the limit of our control of the future. It is only what we imagine. Intense time? The only time that is real is? That's it. Intense time. How about God? Because God has perfect knowledge of the past. And God can experience everything completely. In its entirety. He doesn't even lose one little tiny iota. Of the knowledge of the experience and the feelings of the past. He can experience all of the past perfectly. When? Now. In a moment. And because he has no limitations to being controlled by time, he lives beyond time, he lives in the future also, and he has complete and deep and intimate knowledge of the future also. So God's knowledge of the past, God's knowledge of the future, and God's knowledge of the current is absolutely perfect, complete, nothing missing. So, when we talk about omnipresence, we say God is present not only in all of space, which we'll discuss next week, but God is present in all of time, in the past, in the future, and in today. So those that lived before us, thousands of years before us, God experiences that now. Now, what is important is how do we, as humans, how do we relate to the theory of time? Do we take the, uh, the, the tensed theory of time? which in physics we call theory A. Do we take theory A as our understanding of time? Or do we take theory B, which is there's no tensed in time? We talked briefly about that last week. 
where there is no tensed time, the, those that promote the theory, although not many hold to it, but there is a, it's just a theory, and the tenseless theory is this, that time is only irrelevant and important to those that experience it, and it is eternal. So that moment, meaning this moment, is now eternal. To give you an example, it might, we might say that when we speak a word, when I say a word, that word is now left my mouth, left my lips, and it is out there in space somewhere. And maybe they will someday have an instrument that can capture that word. Now, we're only talking about my word, but what about messages that go over on your telephones? Text messages. Today we've been talking about telephones since morning till now. <laughs> when you send a text message, it leaves your phone invisibly, without any sound, and it travels through, and it goes to where it's going. But it can be interrupted by other instruments, so it's flying around in other places. How do we know how long it's going to travel? Is it going to travel for the next 30 seconds? Sometimes there is an interruption in the transmission and you don't see the text for some reason or another for another day or something. So, just as that moment, just as that text, just as that word may travel through for eternity, there are those that may think that an action or this experience exists forever. This is a very difficult thing to explain, by the way. So, they say, according to, according to that, according to B theory of time, Christ is on the cross, and He's on the cross forever. Because that moment lasts forever. There is no relation to anything else. But without spending much more time on this, we'll go back and assume that all believers accept the theory A of tensed time as the real and true theory of time. This is the common theory that most people live in. And what that does is allows us to see that we live within a period of time which has past, present, and future. And God lives in a tense time. He has full knowledge of the tense time, but He's not restricted by that time. To move further, for us, when did time begin? For us, for humans, time began when God created the world. Right? And the evening and the morning were the first day. Then it says, the evening and the morning were the second day. Am I right? So God, for our sake, began time at creation. When the world began to revolve around itself, became a 24-hour When the moon's relationship to this earth became a cycle, a lunar cycle, we now had time. When the earth began to, uh, to, to encircle the sun, we have time. So within that time is our existence. Why am I talking about all this time? In order for us to understand our relationship with God and His omnipresence, it's important to understand God's relationship to time and our relationship to time. We've heard all of our lives God is omnipresent, God is omniscient, and God, <coughs> God is omnipotent. Here, we will study what does God's omniscience have to do with us? What is that relationship with us? What is God's omnipotence in relation to us? 
Because having that information that God is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent, it really has no bearing. But in order for us to know God, we have to have an intimate understanding of these things. The Bible says what? This is life eternal that ye know the only true God. And what makes God God? His omnipotence, His omniscience, and His omnipresence. Therefore, we have to understand these things. Now, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. And verse 8. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a like a day. What does that mean to you? To us. What is a thousand years? It is unthinkable. When we try and think back a thousand years, we cannot, we cannot even remember last week. We can't remember everything we did yesterday. Never mind a thousand years. But to God, it's like a day. And a day is like a thousand years. How does that affect our lives? How does that affect human life? How does it? How old was Moses when he first met God? How old was he? 40 years. The, the number 40 is very important in the life of Moses. Moses was 40 years old when he met God. How old was he when God used him to go and free the people of Israel from Egypt. How old was he? No, he wasn't 40. God told him and directed him to go and live in the wilderness for how many years? Here's a hint. That's a good, good hint, yeah. 40 years. God could have told him, Moses, you're the prince of Egypt. You've got all the training you need. You're young and you're healthy. Let's go. you got a job to do. The people are suffering in Egypt. But no. God sent him back into the wilderness for how many years? 40 years. Because it took him 40 years to sanctify Moses. To train him and to change him and to undo some of the things that he had learned. And after the 40 years, God said, you're now ready. To Moses, he must have thought, oh my goodness, I'm old, I can't go, I can't do this, I can you know. But to God. Those 40 years were just like this. Makes no difference. But he understands and he commiserates and he feels what we feel during our 40 years. He feels everything we feel. Because he has an intimate knowledge of every moment, every second, every minute period of time. But to him, there is no restriction. There is no restriction of time. God is not restricted by time. I've never seen this Indian movie, but uh, I've heard this line that I'm told is from an Indian movie. I don't even know the name of it. Maybe somebody will tell me. Where apparently the hero in the movie, I don't know who the hero is, but whoever it is, says that wherever I stand is where the line begins behind me. So no matter where I stand, that's where the line starts. 
That's quite a statement for a human being to make. But when it comes to God, where and when God decides something starts, that's when time starts. That is the beginning and the end of anything and everything according to the will and the knowledge of God. God knows intimately where and what is being done and needs to be done. Interesting that when we talk about God, the word God is a title. Not necessarily a name, it's a title. Why? Because you could have a Hindu God, you could have a Greek God, you could have a Muslim God, and so on. When we talk about God, we talk about God Jehovah, Yahweh. We talk about God the Father, the L-O-R-D, in capital letters, the God of the Jews in the Old Testament. This is the God we're talking about. When God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He was talking about the gods of the neighbors of the Israelites. In the New Testament, you can say, you're talking about gods that were the gods of the Greeks. In the land where I was born in India, we could compare the God of the Bible to the God of the Hindus. The gods, I should say, plural. The gods of non-biblical believers are not only restricted by space, but by time. Therefore, they have a god of fire. They have a god of rain. They have a god of the sea. They have a god of the wind. And each is restricted to his or her territory. And they are restricted by time in that they have relationships. They get married. They have children. They have fights with one another. They have illicit relationships. They murder. They punish, but within their own realm, within their own realm. Further, in the, in the Ten Commandments, God says, Thou shalt not make any graven images. Why? Because the images that are created by those that are non believers of biblical God make the image and they put the image in a specific spot. And in that spot, this God is restricted by space. I grew up, I loved studying uh, Greek mythology. And if I could find someone who appreciates Greek mythology, I could sit and talk for hours. Because I just spent so much time studying it, loved it. Both my dogs have names that are Greek gods' names. Athena and Pontos. Uh, when you study these Greek gods, you can talk about Mount Olympus. You can talk about Poseidon in, uh, in, in, in the water, God of the seas. You can talk about Athena. They're all restricted. Therefore, it is important to understand that when we as believers talk about a God, we talk about a God who has no restrictions. One day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. How does that relate to us? Turn with me, please, to Romans. Let me see if I can find Romans in this Bible. Maybe they moved it. Oh. Same spot so far. Romans 13. 
verses 11. And I'll read the first part of 12. And do this, understanding the present, what? Time. Time. And do this, under, uh, understanding the present time. What were we talking about? In, in, in tense, for humans, the only time that we have is now. Do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. I think in some of your Bibles it may say, the hour is at hand. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. The night is almost over and the day is almost here. So stop your sleeping. I'm not reading. I'm done reading. So basically, the day is here. So you got to get ready for the day. Paul here is very sensitive to time, the importance of time. That we have to know that we have a limited amount of time. Don't ignore the time. Take advantage of the time. Why? Do we have eternity? Time for sleeping is over. He says, get up, work. Get up, work. Go to John, if you will. The book of John, chapter 9, verse 4. It quotes Jesus Christ. And I can clearly say that because in this Bible, it's in red, unlike my other Bible. This is Jesus speaking, verse 4 of chapter 9, the book of John. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. What does that mean? What does that mean? Let us work while it is day. Night is coming when nobody can work. What is he saying? You got to turn the lights out and go to sleep? He's talking about the end of our life when we go to sleep. And we are covered with darkness. So Jesus is saying, we have work that has been given by our Father and we need to do this work. Here, is where we have a little bit of a problem. We have a little bit of a paradox, a little bit opposite. Why? Why should it matter to God when we work or don't work? To Him, a day is like a thousand years. He lives in eternity, both past and future. So what difference does it make to God? Whether I work or I don't work, whether I sleep, or if I wake up in time to do the work in the morning, What difference does it make? God could leave me. And I could do whatever I feel like doing. But we have a limited amount of time within we have to do, within which we have to do whatever it is that we choose to do. God has no limit to time, but we do. Turn with me to James, chapter 4, 13 to 16. James 4, 13 to 16. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what, you, what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a what? Vapor. Mist or a vapor 
that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. We make plans for ourselves that let's go and accomplish this and accomplish that so we can go and get rich and make money. But we have a limited amount of time. And even that limited amount of time, what we plan must be planned according to the will of? The will of God. It is imperative for us to understand that there is a relationship among the eternity of God and the limited time that we have. Romans chapter 13. Let's go back to Romans chapter 13. And there I will read verse 12 and on. I have to work on it. The pages are still sticking together a little bit. 12. So Romans 13, 12 and on. We read 12 a little bit ago. We're going back to it. We're going to go all the way to the end of the chapter, verse 14. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual and debauchery, not in, dissen not in dissension and jealousy, Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. The Apostle Paul says, you have a limited amount of time. And how are you going to spend that time? In it, the fact that we are limited to time is reason enough for us to have an incentive to decide how we're going to live. And this point is the important point to understand the difference between God existing in timelessness and us being restricted to time. We have a short amount of time. Go to 1 Peter with me because along with having a good life and along with having the privileges of this life that we talked about in the Sabbath school class earlier today, that we are grateful to God for all the good gifts He does. Along with the good gifts, there's also trouble. There's also suffering. And suffering is not limited only to bad people. People of God also suffer. So let's read chapter 5 of 1 Peter. In verse 10, And the God of all grace, who called you to his what? Eternal glory. How long? Eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. So when we suffer, when we have difficulties in our relationships, when we have stress from our business or from our work, when we're sick, and when people persecute us, we know that in God's time, that moment of persecution even death, like the killing of the apostles. They knew, they knew that that time of suffering was limited to the human understanding of time. 
And that human under, uh, understanding of time is not even a dot on the line of eternity. You ask a mother who, when she's giving birth to a child, maybe swearing up and down that never going to have another child again. There is actually a scale of pain. And childbirth is way up there on the scale of pain. And when a mother gives birth, don't want to do this again. But the joy of the child makes the pain to be forgotten quite soon. And before long, they start to plan for another child. The pain and the suffering from the birth of a new life in Christ Jesus is temporary. Temporal life is temporary. But the plans that God has, the glory God has for his, for his believers is eternal as God is eternal. Amen. And in that eternity, we will not remember the pain of this temporal world Amen. and suffering and taunting. There are those who will make fun of your beliefs. There are those who... Who will who, who make a joke out of you and your belief in your God. Or make a, ma make a mockery out of your Bible. But that time will pass. And a new time will come. And that time is for eternity. Go to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 4, 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, 16 to 18. This is encouragement for believers. All of us have difficult times. I can tell you, I can tell you that there are days in my life when I can think back only a few days back and think how could I have thought back about the situation in which I was. And that difficult time passes. The stress goes away. And you get encouraged again Amen. to stand up and move on. Amen. That promise of the encouragement of God keeps us alive, keeps us moving. Let me read to you verse 16 of chapter 4. And, oh, I'm in. Yeah, let me read it. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly, outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Our body may be suffering, our body may be in pain, our body may be sick, but inside we are being sanctified day by day like Moses was. His body was suffering outwardly. He was getting older. But inside, he was getting stronger so he could be the man God needed him to be in front of Pharaoh. At the age of 40, to stand before Pharaoh and to challenge him, Moses would have folded. He needed to experience that growth with God and that experience of growing in God came through a difficult life in the wilderness. We end up in a spiritual wilderness as we grow day to day. We have difficult times. We get beaten up in our lives, at our work, in our relationships with our friends perhaps. 
sometimes within our families, by our children or by our relatives. But the Apostle Paul says, we do not lose heart because through all of this, through all of this, we are renewed. Verse 17, for our light, pay attention now, for our light and momentary troubles. What kind of troubles? Momentary troubles. Are achieving for us and what? Eternal glory. Our momentary troubles are preparing for us eternal glories that far outweigh them. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, not on the temporal world. We don't fix our eyes on all of our problems here. We fix our eyes on what is unseen. Since what, since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Eternal. Go with me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 17. Oh, verse 7, sorry. Ephesians 2, verse 7. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. I'm going to go back a little bit. Go to verse 6. God raised up, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms of, in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God has prepared for us grace and kindness to be with him for eternity. Be with him for eternity. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 32. This is the challenge that the Apostle Paul has the challenge that he has in his belief that there is eternity and that there is heaven. Matthew 25 talks about how when Jesus comes on his right hand, he will have those that are go, going to go with him. Uh, those on the left will end up in death and damnation. The Apostle Paul speaks here to those that are believers. Verse 32. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If we have no hope of the resurrection in Jesus Christ, if we have no hope of eternal life, then leave everything. Leave everything you believe. Live whatever you want to do, live. But the same Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 13 that there is a shortness of time. There is shortness of time. We have to get up and we have to start working. For those that do not believe, 
in an omnip omnipotent God, for those that do not believe in an omniscient God, for those who do not understand or believe the omnipresent God, for them, time is an enemy. For them, time is an enemy. Why? Because they only live within the temporal time. This life that they have, this life that we have, this is the completeness of time for them. But we live in a time which will soon be shared with God's timelessness. That we can become part of the timelessness and eternity that God experiences. And the only way for us to do that is for us to die and to live in Jesus Christ. Amen. We must die in Jesus Christ and we must live in Jesus Christ that God may be able to resurrect us in Jesus Christ to be with God with Jesus for eternity. We need to accept and understand the depth of who God is. That we may be able to relate to Him and we cannot relate to Him unless we know Him. The Bible says this is life eternal that you know the only true God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is my hope that as we study week by week God's Word, that we get a deeper understanding of who God is, Amen. so we can understand how we can relate to Him. God bless you. Amen.